mine damer og herrer, jeg byder dem alle hjertelig velkommen, også de sidste ankomne, men nu kan vi altså heller ikke være flere, så nu kommer de til at, at lukke dørene. Velkommen. This study led to the report called Limits to Growth, which uh, was published about a year ago. Today, about one million copies of this book has been sold all over the world. Uh, Last summer, Professor Meadows was director of an international summer school in, on social system dynamics in Hanover, Germany. And this school was a very great success. The participants were working from 8 in the morning to 12 in the night for two weeks. And the success was to a large extent due to the very inspiring supervision of Professor Meadows. Uh, we are all very much looking forward to hear your talk tonight. I should say that uh, Professor Meadows is very interested in having a discussion after his talk. And we propose to have 10 minutes break after the talk, and then people can come to me with a small note of the name and subject that they want to discuss, and then I'll try to uh, lead the discussion after the break. But we'll first have Professor Meadows now. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be with you tonight. It was almost exactly two years ago that the Club of Rome had a meeting in Ottawa, Canada to discuss the work which was underway at MIT. Last March we released that little book under the title The Limits to Growth and since then life has become much more interesting. <laughs> And today we are much closer to the limits to growth in absolute terms. The ability of the environment to absorb thermal emissions hasn't changed over the last thousand years. But the thermal emissions which we put into the environment has increased many thousands of times. We may still be far away in absolute terms, but when energy doubles every 10 years, we're not very far away in terms of time. Well, there may be one or two other differences between a thousand years ago and, <laughs> and today, but those, it seems to me, are some of the, the most critical. We're beginning now to address the energy situation in our country. It will take us 50 years at least, to shift from petroleum to other sources. And in the physical environment, we also find these delays. There are very long delays in the time between we, when we take an action and when we can find its full consequences, and in the time between the occurrence of a problem and when we find full information about it long delays in our ability to change our social institutions. Who would disagree with that? Well, I'm going to have to get more controversial if we're going to <laughs> have a good discussion. Most of our political and economic and social institutions today have a very, very short time horizon. There is no government which is trying to base its decision on a view of the world 50 years from now. When you have rapid growth, limits, long delays, and a short planning horizon, the system is always unstable. When you have a drunken driver who can respond only very slowly to information which comes to him, and when his foot is on the accelerator going faster and faster, he will have an accident in time. We don't know what he will hit, but he certainly will have an accident. <laughs> the global system is just like that driver, with one exception. 
to a large extent, we're trying to drive the car by looking out the rear window. <laughs> if I may use another analogy, anyone who looks at the global system must be reminded of a ship which takes five miles to stop and which is being steered by 25 different nearsighted captains who can't agree where they want to go and who only look 15 or 20 feet in front of the ship. Now, for some time, this ship has been out in the open seas and these captains have become very proud of their ability to steer the ship. But at some point, the sea comes to an end, some kind of fine steering is necessary, and the system which these captains have is not going to work. Now, in real life, of course, in real ships, we've acknowledged this problem, and we've come up with some solutions. First of all, we've, when you must negotiate uh, many passages, you slow down the ship. That was one of the recommendations of limits to growth. It gives you more time to make decisions. Secondly, you develop radar. What's a radar set? Well, it's simply a way of looking out and asking yourself, where will I be five or ten miles from now if I continue to move in the same direction at the same speed? I'm surprised by the difference between the ship and the real world, however, because when the radar operator comes up to the bridge and says, Captain, Captain, if we continue in the same direction and at the same speed, we're going to run into an iceberg, the captain doesn't say, well, you're a prophet of doom. Instead, the captain, if he has confidence in the radar, accepts that as a useful input and makes certain that he doesn't continue in the same direction and at the same speed. Limits to growth and the models that we've built are our first preliminary effort by our group to develop a social radar system. Very, very imperfect, very inadequate, but they address an important need we must have a social radar which can look out 30 or 50 years because current decisions have an influence over 30 or 50 years and tell us where we will be if we choose this decision or that decision. Another response is one which says maybe there are limits and maybe there aren't but don't worry. The price system technological advance, and social change will stop growth when it's necessary. This, it seems to me, is to put price, technology, and social change as something apart from man. It's to impute it with a certain wisdom and speed uh, that man himself doesn't have. The price system isn't something apart, it's us every day as we make decisions. Technological advance isn't something that just stays in the corner and, and goes ahead. It's us deciding what we want to do and then beginning to allocate resources so that we can do it. And social change clearly isn't anything apart from man and his institutions. While each of these three can provide the solution, at the moment, they aren't. In Switzerland, there are attempts to understand how it is that we can improve the relationship between the mental models that we use for making decisions and the computer models which can handle many variables and tell us which decisions are open to us. You see, the role of our social radar is not to tell us where we should go. It's only to tell us what we, where we can go. So much of our effort today is spent trying to choose between two things when neither one of them is in fact open to us. Computer models can begin to tell us 
what is possible. But it's still going to be left to man to decide what's desirable. There now is beginning to be academic work to understand how you can put these two capabilities together. Suppose this is true. Suppose by the year 2000 or 2020, there must be population and material equilibrium. How could we move towards that equilibrium in a way which would satisfy the basic needs of man and ensure an orderly evolution of our social system? What do current growth processes do for the difference between the rich and the poor? How could we, under conditions of demographic and material equilibrium, move to decrease the gap between the rich and the poor, a gap which is not defensible on moral grounds and which almost certainly will lead to political catastrophe if it's not narrowed down. Even though there is now just the first beginnings of research on mankind's long-term options, it's really nothing compared with the needs. There are far more people in this room tonight than there are in the whole world who are looking at the, the real comprehensive possibilities of mankind over the next 50 years. The contrast between our concern for the global future and other concerns is really perhaps best brought out by our attempts to put three men on the moon. Over a period of 10 years, the United States developed new institutions, a long-range plan, with the objective of putting three men on the moon, leaving them there for a few days safely, and bringing them back. Millions of dollars were spent developing formal computer simulation models, which would help us to anticipate what might be the difficulties in sending men to the moon and back, and what would be the appropriate response if those difficulties arose. We've not spent a half a million dollars trying to understand how to keep 3.6 or 7 billion people on this earth for 50 years. We need a new mode of education. We need a way of teaching people what it means to exist on a closed system. We need to develop an ethic, a set of social values, which is concerned not only about the lateral consequences of our actions, that is to say, the effects of what I do today on other people today, but the chronological dimensions of social change, T teaching me how to choose when what I do today will influence someone 20 or 30 years from now. We need to think in our educational system of new values. The economic values tend to move us towards uniformity and efficiency. We need an ecological value which moves us towards diversity and stability. Those concepts aren't taught in our schools. We need new techniques which will permit us to make long-term forecasts. And we need the data which can be used to feed into those techniques. We need new social indicators which can help us to understand the impact of decisions on all aspects of life. So much of our current decisions are based on a very narrow spectrum of what man really considers to be important. Material consumption, economic gain, and in the short term. I would hope that most of us here have benefited from economic growth to the point where other things are now more important. If that's true, we have a very poor control system helping us to obtain those other objectives. We desperately need research which focuses on the social indicators and the social implications of our acts and which 
takes that information and puts it in to the decision-making organizations. We need to think through new means of conserving energy and material, means which might not be profitable today. Solar energy and even wind power have been discarded because they're not economically efficient. Well, I'll tell you something. I make a little prediction now. The cost that you're going to have to pay for your oil in this country is going to go up by two or three times in real terms over the next 10 years. Now's the time to start thinking what will be economic 10 years from now instead of what was economic 10 years ago. We need a long-term goal which is expressed not only in terms of employment and GNP, but in terms of the quality of life. I suspect that not one of you could really give me a comprehensive and believable description of where your children might be 50 years from now. Certainly I have no image whatsoever of what kind of life they'll be able to lead because we have no long-term goal. Now it's possible to talk about long-term goals, to think not what will be but what could be and to begin thinking how we would move in that direction. We need to do that. It's something that could be done. What do you suppose is the optimum population in Denmark? Well, I don't know either but it's something that one could study relative to a number of different goals. So think about the limits in terms other than strictly biological. Understand that there are social limits as well. One of the things I regret about limits to growth is that it does tend to portray growth and its limits in strictly physical terms. We say in the book that we did that to find the maximum boundary, recognizing that social limits may stop growth much earlier than we actually forecast. I would say that if we really looked at it, we would find we had already in most Western countries, and certainly in the less industrialized countries, passed the social limits to growth. That is to say that further growth only decreases social options. We need to find alternatives to material growth in solving difficult social problems. One of the responses to our book is that we can't stop growth while there are poor people. In fact, growth as it takes place today is opening the gap between the rich and the poor. In the United States over the last 10 years, the difference in income between the rich and the poor has increased. Certainly that's been the case between the rich countries and the poor countries. Growth as it's proceeding today is not solving the distribution problem. It's only making it worse. It's concentrating wealth. It's time to quit hiding behind the presumed power of growth in solving that difficult problem and recognize it for what it is, a difficult ethical issue one which can't be solved to everyone's satisfaction, but which must be solved better than it is today, and in ways other than by sustaining growth. We have to find other ways for people to feel some progress than through the accumulation of material goods. There are many things which are considered to be important to people. Certainly we can come to define a society where when you ask someone how well off are you? He doesn't tell you how many cars he has and how many houses and so forth, but talks in other terms. I'd like to see a little city or a little community with some farmers and some small factories and so forth where the medium of, of exchange was not dollars and price set through bidding, but in terms of the energy and the material content of the goods which are exchanged. That might turn out to have some very undesirable consequences, but I think it would teach us something about our own system. 
I'm encouraged by the efforts of some of the people in the youth movement and in the not so youthful movement to explore with new ways of structuring human interactions and, uh, and giving up certain material goods. On a more pragmatic level, we have to start looking at the role of old people in our society. There are going to be a lot more of them when population growth slows down. Not only that, their experience is likely to be more relevant as material growth begins to decline and change is not so rapid. Most of the reaction against the idea of material equilibrium is because we have no idea of what it could be. For the last 200 years, our personal goals, our social institutions, our economic science have all been predicated on the assumption of infinite and indefinite growth. That growth will stop. It's time then to make material equilibrium something which is known and understood. There are many different kinds of material equilibria towards which we could move. You don't necessarily have to have a dictatorship. You don't necessarily have to have a static condition of mankind. You don't necessarily have to put everybody back on the farm to have material equilibrium. Though I personally feel if we ignore the inevitability of material equilibrium, the one we end up with is much more likely to be a dictatorship, much more likely to be essentially agrarian, and much more likely to be static. Today, and perhaps for the next 10 years, we really have a unique chance. We have a tremendous momentum and a stock of resources which can be used in many different ways. We have technical resources and a good deal of expertise. They've only, I think, been directed in the wrong way. Everyone in this room could spend his own resources and direct his own skills and knowledge towards some useful aspect of understanding what are the promises and the potentials of material equilibrium. If even a few of you could adopt that, then I would say that was a very good response to limits to growth. Thank you.